Okay, this is going to be the installation instruction video series for my remote extended runtime fuel system for the California approved Honda EU 3000 IS. First item we're putting the fuel kit on is going to be to remove the cabinetry. Cabinetry comes off front cover with four acorn nuts. This bottom acorn nut seems to be pulling the entire stud out. It means that the stud is not locked tightly into the frame on this one. <coughs> when you pull the front cover off, Make sure that the foam gasket stays in the groove. If it does not stay in the groove, simply push it back in. That's part of the sound deadening. And this is the stud that I spoke of that seems to be stuck to the nut. So we'll go ahead and pull that stud off of this nut. <coughs> this is a California approved model by the fact that there's this small hose coming out of the back cover. on this generator being a California model that it has the evaporative emissions canister installed out here which is not on the standard models
next item will be to remove the grill from the back of the generator. And the grill is simply held on with four six millimeter bolts. up the bolts, but it just looks more factory, more nicer, if you put it back together with the correct bolts in the correct spot. The rear heat shield, slide the top out, then this bottom corner on the California model will have to be bowed out to get around the engine mount, and it'll flex just enough to clear that engine mount. On the early style or non-California approved that does not have the emissions canister here, the heat shield wraps all the way around and continues down this flange area. So on that one you'll have to bow both sides out around the motor mount. emissions canister because it'll make it a whole lot easier to see what we're doing. It's not critical that it be removed for the installation of a fuel kit, but it does make it a lot easier. And it's simply held on with two more six millimeter bolts. Same thread pitch as the ones that held the grill on and the back cover, but these are silver and they're identical to the ones that held the grill on. And if you come around to this side of the generator, you see that the California approved model. Might as well we get some more light on it. Has these hoses running across right under the spark plug access panel. And that's going to cause us to have to mount the fuel pump differently on the California approved version than what it has done on the standard version. And I'll cover that when we get into installing the fuel pump. This is probably as good a place as any to take a break for now. Okay, inside this cover, we're going to go ahead and remove the lid for the air box. The air box lid is simply held on with four clips to snap into place. It is a little bit tight in here. Not much I can do about that.
And then we're going to remove the ear box itself. The ear box is held on with one six millimeter bolt, which is in the bottom right hand corner, right here, and two six millimeter nuts, which go right onto the studs that hold the carburetor on. So when you take the two six millimeter nuts off, the carburetor can slide on the mounting studs. box and that'll be this form hose right here in the corner. You fold the clips that hold the ear box lid back to the closed position and give you just a little bit more room to slide the air box out of here. Now if you look On the back, you'll see that the California model has this hose for the evaporative emissions canister, which is clipped into the back of the air box. So if you want, you can take the air box all the way out, or you can just fold it out of the way. Just fold it out of the way like this is actually just enough room to get the job done. I'm going to go ahead and remove it simply because we're shooting the video and we need better visibility. do that. Slide the larger of the two hoses out of the slot and then pull the smaller hose out of those two clips where it's attached right here and here. this gasket from around the door. The gasket around the door does not have to be removed, but if you remove the gasket, it reduces the risk of damaging it when you go to drill the hole to mount the fuel pump. And since it doesn't take that much extra work to remove the gasket, I'd go ahead and do it. We'll go right into the fuel pump. On the non-California approved models, these two hoses are not here. So on the non-California approved models, you can hold the fuel pump where the pulse port, which aligns with this silver or gold screen, is pointing straight down and mount it right in this position. What you would do is set it against the heat shield and slide it up and to the right as far as it can go where it just starts to hit the radius curve where this nut is welded inside of for the spark plug cover. It doesn't need to go any higher than that. On the California approved models, I'll pull this emissions hose out of the way, it will wind up sitting almost like this with the two holes directly above each other instead of like this on the other models. There's no reason that you can't mount all of them like this. On the non-California approved model, if you mounted it like this, the only thing you're giving up is on the California approved models, you won't be able to put a bolt into this hole because you cannot drill through the cover. Actually, I suppose you could drill a hole through the housing, but nobody really wants a hole in the outer housing of their generator because they're kind of ugly looking. But at any rate, so on the California approved model, which this is, put the fuel pump in place, slide it up to where the fuel pump just touches this piece of metal with the clip on it right where it's spot welded to the heat shield. Slide it up as high as it can go I don't know if this is creating too much glare but right here in the corner where this is spot welded you can slide the fuel pump up to where it just touches this area then take a marker and mark
the hole where the mounting screw is going to have to be drilled. So that'll be in this position right here. <coughs> We're going to drill the initial hole with a 1 8 drill bit. I'll come back and put a 9 64 hole in it because the screw is going to be a number 10 sheet metal screw. Incidentally, like I said, with the non-California approved models, if you do a cho or choose to mount it up and to the right, you'll be able to mount both mounting screws. There will be two mounting screws coming in every kit. If you're putting it on a California model, you won't be able to use both screws. So now if you look, slide the fuel pump in here, you'll see the top screw goes here, and because the bottom bracket is way down here, you'd have to drill through your outer housing in order to attach that. There is not a lot of stress put on the fuel pump mounting bolt. By the time you get the hoses on, you really don't need any screws at all, but having a screw locates the pump so you can cut your hoses to the appropriate length. The next step is going to be to remove the valve cover. The valve cover is held on by four six millimeter bolts. Simply remove the four six millimeter bolts and the valve cover will rotate out. spark plug lead and the breather hose from the valve cover. Rotate the valve cover out of the way. You notice the fine folks at Honda have now put a layer of grease on the inside of the valve cover. That's to stick the valve cover gasket to the valve cover to make it slightly less difficult to reinstall. It doesn't make it easy, but it does make it less difficult. Real quickly here, this being a California approved version, this valve cover is a valve cover that comes on the other ones, the old style or the non-California approved and lift the gasket out of the way. You'll notice the California approved model has a larger area for you to put the pulse port into. The non-California approved model is a lot trickier. You have to bullseye exactly the right spot for this hole. On the non-California approved model, look at this groove, line up, on the outer flange, you'll see that I put a black mark with a magic marker. Even with that mark, or up about six to eight millimeters, put the nut that is included in the kit 
hold it against the flange and put a mark with a magic marker. That indicates where you're going to need to drill the hole. On the California approved model you have slightly more room but I encourage you to do your level best to get the, the hole drilled in the exact spot where it needs to go and you'll see why later. Again hold the nut firmly against this gasket surface line it up with this groove which is where the rocker arms for the adjustment for the valve clearance go to and put a dot right in the center of the nut and that's where the hole is going to be drilled. And that's probably as good a place to take a break as any. Okay. The valve cover is an outer shield and then pressed into it is a breather plate and it has a check valve into it. So before you go to drill the hole in the valve cover, which will go through the breather cover also, take a pair of vice grips and clamp the two together because otherwise when you're drilling the hole the breather cover can be forced out and then the hole will no longer line up precisely through the valve cover itself and the breather cover. So just take a pair of vice grips and clamp the two together. What I do is I use a 1 8 drill bit again for the pilot hole. And I'll drill a pilot hole right where the black dot is and then I'll check it to make sure that I like the position. Now that I've got the hole drilled, take the nut and hold it into position and make sure that the hole is indeed dead center of the nut. And that's nice. Then what I'll do, go ahead and switch. Put in a 930 seconds drill bit. to drill the final hole. If you use a good quality sharp drill bit, it'll leave a lot less deburring for you to do in the end. Now keep in mind that since this is thin sheet metal, there will be some deburring to do. If you look closely, you see small burrs right around here. There's a couple of ways you can deburr it. One was it is with a burring knife, which as you can see has a triangular shaped blade. Or the other is with a repairman's reamer choice is yours. just a couple of minutes to go ahead and deburr the whole thing. But it makes it a lot nicer fit when you're done. <clears throat> Once you get the hole drilled and deburred, you can go ahead and remove the vice grips. And as you can see, there's no offset between the valve cover and the breather plate now.
this is a pulse port and this is what's going to be screwed into the hole that we just drilled into the valve cover. This nut that's on the pulse port is chamfered on this side so that the o-ring will sit into a recessed area and as you tighten it down the o-ring will squeeze in there even tighter. This side of the nut actually has a step cut because here is another fitting and you'll see that there's a flange on it and in order for the nut to push up tight against the uh, elbow fitting I've cut a recessed area into the nut. The kits will come with a spare elbow fitting just in case you mess one up and get another shot at it. When you do, just make sure that you get this nut on correctly. The chamfered side goes towards the O-ring and the side with the step goes away from the O-ring. To install it, push and turn. The hole is drilled just slightly smaller than the elbow fitting so that it's a nice snug fit. And within one revolution, it should pop into the, the recessed area. And this one did. You'll notice that one of the flats of the nut sits right even and flush with the flange on the valve cover. Rotate the port so that if you'll notice you've got one radius here, a very slight radius here, and then two more radiuses here. So point the port to where it lines as close to this radius as possible because the valve cover will bolt to the engine like this and the closer to vertical this port is the better it works. The purpose being that there is a certain amount of oil in here. That's why they put this oil return line. And because there is a certain amount of oil in the valve cover you don't want the oil being pumped out through the pulse line. So when it heads vertically because the pulse line is actually a uh, positive and negative pressure wave, it will pull almost as much oil back down as it puts up. So as long as it's pointing upward, you've got very little chance of losing oil. If your generator is overfilled on oil, you will get oil out the pulse line and your first sign will be oil dripping from this little screen on the fuel pump. Truth be known, that will not harm the operation of the fuel pump or anything else. But if you see oil dripping out of here, that's an indication that you may have overfilled the oil slightly. Probably better to overfill it than it is to run with no oil in it though. Okay, so once you get the fitting put in place, you'll take the second nut that you use to mark the location of the hole and screw it on. Check your orientation of the pulse port before you tighten it down all the way. Once you've got it tightened down, you'll notice that there's quite a bit of tail, the tapered area of the pulse port sticking out into the valve cover area. In order to make certain that tail does not hit the locker arm pivots, take a razor blade and trim about the last four millimeters of it off. One of the advantages of having a nylon fitting instead of a brass one, it's a lot easier to cut. As 
So now that the end of it is trimmed off, the alignment of the pulse port is right even with this radius curve. At this point, inspect your valve cover gasket. Make sure it's not torn. This engine was brand new, never been run yet. If your valve cover gasket is torn, the kits do come with a new valve cover gasket. If your valve cover gasket is torn in any way, shape, or form, go ahead and use the new gasket. That's what I sent it for. If your old gasket is in perfect condition, you can save the new gasket and use that when you go to do a valve adjustment later on during your routine service adjustments. Let's see if I can get this in without the gasket falling out of place. Like I indicated earlier, that's why Honda puts a little bit of grease on there. It allows the valve cover to stick to the gasket just slightly. is on rubber motor mounts so if you need to rock the engine over in the engine bay just slightly to get that valve cover in there go ahead and do it it'll flex about six to eight millimeters actually Before you go putting the bolts in, you got to make sure that the gasket is correctly in place. And a good place to look is right over here. If you'll notice on the valve cover, there's a recessed area here. You'll actually be able to see gasket right through this area. If you don't see gasket through that area, that's an indication that the gasket's not in there. And if you look at this, you'll see that there is no gasket there. So the gasket fell out of place, which means I get to try it again. Don't lose patience. certain that the gasket is right on the gasket surface. Before you go bolting it down. Okay. This is probably as good a place as any and take a break. Okay, as I said earlier, if you look at it, this is the valve cover, and here is a notch. That when the valve cover is in place just right, you'll be able to see just a little bit of valve cover through that notch on this side, because this side of the valve cover is very difficult to see. Then if you look at this side, if you pull the valve cover out just a little bit, you'll be able to shine the flashlight in there and see that your valve cover is in place correctly. So if you look on this one, I don't know if the flashlight is washing it out or not, but right behind the spark plug you can see just the edge of the valve cover gasket running straight up through here. Once you get the valve cover in place and the gasket in place, go ahead and torque them down. get your torque wrench out, it would be 10 newton meters. I guess in English that's about 8 foot pounds. Or just snug.
take another look at it and make sure that the gasket hasn't squeezed out of place or anything else. If you do need to use the gasket, don't hesitate, that's what it's there for. It's just like the plastic elbow fitting, or excuse me, nylon elbow fitting. The next item is going to be to drill a hole for the pulse line, which is going to attach to this port. It's going to loop up and then come back down and then go through the heat shield right down here. It's then going to hook onto the pulse port on the fuel pump. I prefer to use a 1 8 drill bit. If you have 6 or 9 inch drill bits, they make this job a little bit easier. On the California approved models, see with the grommet that the evaporative emission canister goes through. On a level almost even with that, anywhere between the evaporative emissions canister and this stud, move over about one inch from the rubber grommet and drill your pilot hole. Don't go more than an inch, because if you look on the back side of it, you'll see that you're going to interfere with the float bolt and the drain lines on the carburetor. Go a maximum of one inch over. And again, drill the pilot hole. Once you've got the pilot hole drilled, then take a one half inch drill bit and drill the final size hole. Because this is thin sheet metal, the drill bits will have a tendency to catch. You will have to drill, drill deeper the hole. Because on this one you can't get at it at an angle. I'll use a repairman's reamer to deburr it. that's going through this hole it does not carry gasoline, it carries air.
just like in the valve cover, the deburring process is a little bit tedious, but it is important. all the drilling, go ahead and vacuum up all the burrs. It looks nicer, number one. And number two, it's a lot cleaner. Okay, the kit will come with the drawing, which will give you the rough length of all the hoses. The kit's going to come with a little over five feet of quarter inch fuel line. The pulse hose is going to be a 22 inch hose. We'll cut a section of the quarter inch hose at 22 inches. I'm going to go ahead and cut this at 22 and a half. That way if the end is a little bit messed up, I can trim it straight. Okay, I'm going to feed it in through the spark plug access panel and plug it onto the pulse port that we installed in the valve cover earlier. Now it's onto the pulse port. At this time, go ahead and put a hose clamp on it. The kit comes with two different sizes of hose clamps. The larger clamps are for the quarter inch hose. The smaller clamps will be for the 3 16 hose. Since this is a quarter inch hose, it gets the larger size clamp. Truth be known, this being a pulse line, you could get away without putting a clamp on it. But the kit comes with lots of clamps. More than you'll need, in fact, so you might as well use them all. I'm going to go ahead and put the breather line onto the valve cover and put the spark plug boot in place down. Then what I'll do is take the pulse line and run it down and plug it in. Notice the pulse line now runs just below the spark plug boot and against this wall comes down, makes a gentle curve, and then comes out through the heat shield right here. Notice this flange on this heat shield. It carries through and it is also down on the bottom of the heat shield. Don't run any of the fuel lines or the pulse lines against that. If the pulse line were to cut, it wouldn't leak fuel. But if a fuel line were to get cut on that, you'd have a 
a fire hazard. That's probably as good a place as any to take a break. And what you do now is trim the end of the pulse line nice and straight. And the pulse port on the carburetor, as I had indicated earlier, is the one that lines up with this gold screen. It'll be marked by the letter P on the fuel pump. You'll notice that this port on the fuel pump has a small arrow pointing inward. That'll be the fuel inlet. And this port has a little arrow pointing outward. And that'll be the fuel output. I'm going to go ahead and put the pulse line on now because it is easier to do it that way. And then put a clamp on it. I'm going to orient the clamp so that the clasping portion faces towards the heat shield on the generator and only because that gives me more room later on as things start to get tight particularly on the California model. So now as you can see the clasp on the fuel block or the pulse line is out of the way so that we'll have more room to put the fuel inlet line on. pump up into place and make sure when you do that the pulse line does not come anywhere near this radius edge and you'll notice it smoothly runs way away from the radius edge so that's good I'm now going to put one of the number 10 by 3 quarter inch belt head screws into this top hole and I'm only going to put it in loosely putting more hoses in later on and we'll be pulling that back out again. You can take the float bowl drain and float bowl vent line and unplug them from these two holes for the time being and just tuck them up out of the way so that they don't get in your way on this. At this point you're done back behind this area. step is going to be to remove the front lower panel. It's not critical that you remove this panel, but it will be easier to videotape it so you can see exactly what I'm doing. There's a tab right on the panel that sticks about 10 millimeters to the left of the battery itself. So right even with this edge and down about the second fin is where you're going to drill a hole for the fuel fitting. And again what I'll do is put a 1 8 inch pilot hole. even with the edge of this tab and the second vent fin. The reason I go down to the second vent fin is the plastic cover covers up the top edge of this and you don't want to have a conflict.
and the deburring process on this is the same as it is on the other one. Incidentally, I drill the hole out to a one half inch because that way with the deburring it eventually cleans it up just slightly larger than a half inch so that the fuel fitting will fit snugly in it. Okay. The fuel fitting and the hose barb are both pipe thread. So test fit them together and see how much of a gap you've got. The kits will come with a washer which is strictly to be used as a shim. Now just finger tight this washer will barely fit in. So when you put the wrenches on and tighten it down the washer won't fit in. So on this particular kit I'm not going to use the washer because it'll tighten down and pinch right on this metal piece. If the gap were larger, say about like this, where the washer had plenty of play back and forth, I would put the washer in there next to this piece of metal in the back so it was hidden, so it would take up any groove. Because like I said, these are a pipe thread, which is a tapered thread. So you'll take the Teflon tape, which is included in the kit, and put at least three full layers over the threads and make sure not to overlap the end of the thread because if you do that will allow the piece of tape to get cut off and it'll then end up in the fuel system. Hopefully it'll get caught in the fuel filter but there's always a chance of something going wrong. You can orient the fuel fitting any direction you want except for straight up or straight down because straight down it's going to be sitting on something you won't be able to get your fuel fitting on it straight up it'll be in the way of the plastic cover but this way or this way will work i point it to the left no particular reason for it at all i just do so if where your generator is going to be installed if it should go to the right, that's perfectly acceptable. you'll want to set this up so when it pinches tight against this metal it is pointed in the direction that you ultimately want it to be facing. Like so. So now when we belt this panel back on it will be facing to the left. You'll see that the fuel comes in through the quick disconnect fitting, enters the T fitting here, comes from the stock tank, enters the T fitting here, 
The two then go to the inlet port on the fuel pump, and then from the outlet port on the fuel pump, through the fuel filter, and then on into the carburetor. So what I'm going to do now is put the outlet port on the fuel pump, the fuel filter, and then run it onto the carburetor. From the fuel pump to the fuel filter is a seven inch length of hose. So we'll go ahead and trim this one to seven inches. We may need to shorten it a little bit later. For the purpose of the video, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the fuel pump and slide it out so you can see what I'm doing. This hose is going to go on the output side of the fuel pump. This hose clamp, I'm going to have the clasp portion facing outward. The reason is if I face the clasp inward, it may touch the metal heat shield which won't cause a serious problem, but it may cause a buzzing sound as the generator is running. And the whole reason that people buy this particular model of generator is because it is so quiet. So when it's installed, the output line is going to head off in this direction. And you'll need to trim this hose to the proper length to make sure that the fuel filter does not touch this radius edge. I like to extend the hose past that radius edge so that the filter is way out here because the hose is much narrower and has a much easier time of clearing that. So now I'll go ahead and tuck the fuel pump back in where it belongs and put the screw back in place. If I could just find my screwdriver, that's probably as good a place as any to go ahead and take a break. Okay, if you look, the hose that we just installed on the output of the fuel pump, which is right down here, is going to need to be trimmed to where it's about a half an inch to the right of this flange. And that way it'll give us enough room to put the fuel filter on it without the fuel filter coming in any danger of hitting that flange. Notice that the fuel filter hooks to a 16, or excuse me, a 12-inch section of 3 16 hose. We're going to take the 3 16 hose, cut us a 12-inch section of it. I actually cut it a little bit longer than 12 inches because it's a lot easier to trim it short than it is to try and stretch it. I'm dipping the end of the filter in a little bit of light oil because this is a tight fit and it makes it just slightly easier to get that hose on the end of that filter. Like I said earlier, the hose or the kit will come with two different sizes of hose clamps. The smaller clamps are for the 3 16 hose. So this location, we'll get one of the smaller clamps. Now if you look, there's a small 3 16 fuel hose running from the fuel selector valve to the carburetor. We're going to remove that hose. And 
this hose is simply held in place with carbon clamps. Corbin clamps, you simply squeeze the tips and the clamp will come off. Okay. What we'll do now is this is the fuel filter. You'll notice that there's an arrow which points in the direction of fuel flow, which points from the pump to the carburetor. This end is going to plug in to the output hose on the fuel pump that we installed earlier and then it'll get a large hose clamp in this position. Okay. I've got the fuel filter plugged in and it's below the pulse line. But you can see there that the hose clamp is butted up tightly. Or excuse me, that the hose is butted up tightly. You notice that the filters I use have got two different spigots on the end of them. The larger one is for 5 16 the smaller one is for quarter inch hose. So that hose is butted up tightly against this. So it's over the quarter inch hose. And then you'll put a hose clamp around this portion of it. This being a quarter inch hose, it'll get the larger hose clamps. I'm going to go ahead and remove the fuel pump strictly to make it easier to be visible on camera because what I'm doing down here while I can see it perfectly clear Robert's indicating that he can't see it with the camera so it's going to go into this position this is your pulse line this is the fuel pump this is the short section of hose coming around you want this clamp facing backwards or excuse me facing the heat shield the only reason why I like this clamp facing against the heat shield is because then this razor thin area can't come anywhere near the fuel filter because this portion of the clamp is against the flat portion of the heat shield which pretty much protects this so this will lay in here just like this and this hose will then connect onto the side of the carburetor. So I'll go ahead and put the fuel pump back in place again. Like I say, it is not critical that you remove the fuel pump for that particular operation while you're installing it. I just did that to make it clearly visible for the purpose of this instruction video. Now if you'll look down here, you'll see that that hose clamp is bracing against this portion of the heat shield so that in no time does that sharp edge come in contact with the fuel hose at all. The output 3 16 fuel line it's just going to run around through a gentle arc and plug right back onto the side of the carburetor where the small hose that we removed earlier came off of. Now you can see where it's going on at. Right on the spigot on the side of the carburetor. We'll take another small hose clamp and put it in the kit and put it in this location.
just make sure that your hoses run in nice smooth radius bends. This hose could actually be trimmed shorter and still go on. So if you trimmed it shorter it would go like this. In fact I like that better anyway. I trimmed this a little too long. So I'm going to shorten it. I like the way that looks. trim about two and a half inches off of it. Incidentally, these hose clamps are reusable. If you don't have the patience to open up the clamp, just go ahead and grab a fresh clamp. The easiest way to undo them is just slide them sideways like that, unclamp them. If you don't have the patience to do that, just grab a fresh clamp. There are extras included in the kit. Okay, so now the hose will lay right behind the air filter like this. Okay. The next hose is going to be the fuel inlet hose. The fuel inlet hose, one will come from the stock fuel tank, one will come from the front fitting, and the third hose will go to the fuel pump. That's probably as good a place as any to take a break for a minute. Okay, the first length of hose that we're going to trim will be the hose that goes from the quick disconnect fitting and hose barb to the T. That's 18 inch section of hose. So I'm going to trim it just a little bit longer. 18 and a half. Put that onto the T fitting. Then there's a four and a half section, four and a half inch section that goes from the T fitting to the inlet port on the fuel pump. So I'm going to go ahead and trim a section about five inches long. being that we can always shorten these when we're done. Now when this is installed in the generator, the center pin is going to be facing parallel to the ground away from your body. So the hoses are cut off of rolls so they still have a little bit of a natural curve left in them for when they were on the rolls. The short section, I want it to curve up into the air so it'll plug on to the fuel pump. The longer section is going to curve around behind the control panel on the generator and then come through the front. So I want the natural curve of it to curve around this way and then we'll double it back in the end. Then there's a five inch section of hose that's going to go out and curve up to go to the fuel selector valve. And we've got about an eight to ten inch section left. So I'm going to put that onto the third port. So there's what you've got. If you look at the generator, you look just above the port that we put in, you'll see where my finger is coming through from the back. That's where the long section of hose is going to come through. And we'll just let that hang out the front for now. And we're going to test fit this in here. 
go ahead and pull that back out again. Route it under the harness, as you can see here. I want you to be able to see this good. Can you see that with the flashlight? Okay, great. We're going to route it under the harness. And then coming out the front. Where it will eventually hook to this hose bar. We'll lay that down now so you can see it better. A lot of the things that I'm doing you won't have to do when you do the install because you're not trying to videotape it and make it clearly visible for a camera. But that has plenty of extra hose hanging out now. This is the T-fitting that we installed earlier. Laying right down here. This section of hose is going to curve up and plug on to the input line or input port on the fuel pump. And what we have right now is approximately a half inch longer than what it needs to be. And again, that's because I trimmed all my hose sections slightly longer than what it indicates on the paperwork that I send with all the kits. And just because this one seems to be going dead on with all the uh, measurements that I've got listed, I would still encourage you to cut the fuel line slightly longer than I've indicated because it's very simple to trim them shorter once you get it in place. And you're not going to be able to stretch them and make them longer. Okay, so we're going to take a large hose clamp, put it in this position, side of the pump. Keeping in mind that this is a vacuum line so it's probably not going to leak fuel but again I've included the hose clamps with the kit you might as well use them. Now I'm going to lift the hose T up and we're going to put hose clamps in all three positions on that. And again that's hose, that's four inch hose so it's going to get the larger clamps. Okay, if you look at it, you'll see that this is the last section of hose and it's ultimately going to connect to the fuel shutoff or fuel selector valve. If you look over here on the chart, it shows that hose being a 5 inch section of hose going through this reducer adapter to go from quarter inch to 3 sixteenths. And at the 3 sixteenths, it needs to be a 5 inch long. Take a small hose clamp, put it on 
with the adapter. And now, let's go back to the generator. And what I like to do is take the large quarter inch hose that comes up and hide the adapter right here even with the air box mount. That way you've got the clamps holding the hose away from the air box mount. So where this comes up in radiuses, I'll mark it right where it's even with this bracket on the air box. And I'll cut it here. And then I'll put 3 16 to quarter adapter in place. As you can see now, this hose goes from quarter inch to 3 16 of an inch. And it's going to tuck right back here. So I'll go ahead and put a large hose clamp in this location. Now this is tucked nicely behind the airbox bracket. This length of hose is 3 sixteenths of an inch. It was labeled on the kit as a 5 inch section of hose. We had about 7 inches left. The way this is going to lay in there, we can actually trim it to right about here and it'll fit perfectly onto the uh, dual selector valve. As you can clearly see, the kit comes with extra hose well beyond what you're actually going to need. And once again, being a 3 16 hose, this will get the small clamp going on to the bottom of the fuel selector valve. So that that's not coming off. Then you've got your float bowl vent tube and your float bowl drain hose and the original clamp that held the two of those together. Go ahead and put the clamp in place. And now you can run the hoses back out of the original holes. And that's probably as good a place as any to go ahead and take a break. Okay, if you'll notice I've got the float bowl vent hose, hose and the float bowl drain hose routed out of the bottom of the generator in their stock position. Now what we're going to do is take the original air box, we'll snap the evaporative emission canister hoses back into the original position here, slide this in place, and then tuck this emissions hose into the receiver here. If you look at the original hose, It just barely cleared right where this paint dot is. To snap into the top position. And it snapped into this hose here, or this clamp here. At that point, we'll then slide the ear box. onto the two studs, press it in place. Take a flashlight and make certain that none of the hoses are pinched.
you'll see with the evaporative emissions hose, comes out of the fuel tank, it runs up over the top of the air box, right here, back down, and curves just above the stock bracket for the air box. So when the air box is pushed back into place, it's nice and snug. At that point, we'll go ahead and put the nuts and mount the air box onto the carburetor mount studs. Make sure everything looks good. Pull the choke out. Make sure that the choke moves smoothly. And we'll put the bottom bolt through the gearbox bracket and tighten that down. On the generator. On the California models, they put a guard on the heat shield to keep it from chafing the wiring harness. The kit comes with a piece of braided hose. Slide that over the fuel line also. On the California models, it's possible that you don't actually need it, but it comes with a kit, you might as well use it. Make sure that the hose flows nice and smoothly, no sharp bends. And trim the hose to where it ends, right even with the front of the battery, so that whenever you bolt the front cover in place, it'll slip right onto the hose bar. Push this back in place, make sure that the braided hose protects the fuel line from this edge of the heat shield. And go ahead and put your four acorn nuts in place. are in place. Go ahead and hook the breather hose to the fitting on the end of the air box. Make sure that the other end of the breather hose is tucked into the fitting on the valve cover. Then the evaporative emission hose, it had to be 
removed. Tucks into the back of the air box. And then the evaporative emissions canister. This does not need to be removed for the installation of the kit, but it certainly makes it a lot easier to videotape. Put back in place. Two six millimeter bolts. filter, the air box lid back in place. It is a tight fit, but as you remember, it was always a tight fit. Nothing we have done has made it any worse. It's held in place by the four clamps. So then I'm going to go ahead and replace the gasket that went around this door before putting the spark plug cover in place. Spark plug cover, hooks at the top, held in place by a screw at the bottom. When you put it in place, just make sure that it does not pinch your pulse line to your fuel pump. The only thing left to do at this point is to go ahead and finish installing the cabinet and then test run it. Probably as good a place as any to go ahead and take a break. Okay. The next section will be to put the cabinetry back together. As you remember on the California model, you've got to spread the heat shield around this motor mount. On the other 48 state model, or other 49 state model, excuse me, you've got to bow both of the bottom sides around the lower motor mount. shield in place, simply make sure that it's tucked inside these two tabs at the bottom here and fold it up into place. The next item will be the bottom cover.
make sure that the hose from the evaporative emissions canister sticks through this cover. And as you remember, this cover was held in place by four bolts that are already painted black. seem counterintuitive to do the lift handle now, but if you remember, if the grill is in place, you can't get at the forward bolts to put the lift handle on. So that's why the lift handle goes on first. cover on, make sure that the foam gasket is in place all the way around, and make sure that these spacers are in place. Sometimes they fall out fairly easily. It's easier to wind this up if you open the oil fill door so that you can see what you're doing. This is held on with four acorn nuts too. Incidentally, the acorn nuts that go into the plastic covers have a large flange on them. The acorn nuts that hold the front shield do not have a large flange. They have a smaller one. So you'll have eight acorn nuts with large flanges and four of the acorn nuts with small flanges. Truth be known, they are the same thread pitch. So they will work. And I have had some units in here that they had uh, mixed those up. So apparently at the dealership where it was prepped for sale, they were crossed up. Most likely whenever the mechanic installed the battery. 
Incidentally, I installed the battery and put oil in this unit between video segments because of the fact that putting the oil in it and installing the battery is covered in the owner's manual. And far be it from me to say something that conflicts with how Honda thinks it should be done. The front cover also has the foam gasket and it also has the metal spacer. So make sure that they're in place before sliding the front cover on. And now you'll see that there is a gap between the brass fitting and the plastic cover and that's why I make sure that the brass fitting is in line with the second vent as far as vertical when I drill the hole. Included in the kit is also a sticker that simply tells you the operating procedure for using the generator on the remote tank versus the stock tank. I include the sticker with it just in case the person operating the generator at the time is not the person that installed the kit. You can put the sticker anywhere you want. I put it right here simply because it's clearly visible when you're putting fuel in it. Just take one more quick look. Make sure nothing is in any danger of getting pinched or hurt or damaged or anything like that. That's all there is to it. In the next video segment, we'll roll it into the next room, fire it up and run it. Okay. Let's go ahead and test run this. The operating procedure for the uh, extended runtime remote fuel tank is pretty straightforward and simple. It's covered here in the decal. First step is make sure that the remote tank is full of gasoline. Trust me, it's full. Then take the hose included in the kit. The kits will actually get a brand new hose, not this nasty one. Look at the prime bulb and look at the arrow on the prime bulb. Make sure that the arrow on the prime bulb is pointed in the direction of gasoline flow, which means from the tank to the generator. You'll then quick connect, or connect one of the quick connects to the fitting on the fuel tank. Make sure that the vent on the fuel tank is open. Take the other quick disconnect fitting and connect it to the fitting on the front of the generator. If this is the first time that the generator is being run, or the first time it's being has been run over a long period of time, put the fuel selector valve in the on position. 
This is because this hose is most likely full of air. Pump the prime bulb until it works all the air out of the hose. What it'll do is it's going to take fuel out of the tank, pumping it through the hose, through the fuel pump, fuel filter, and all the hoses in the generator, and into the stock tank where the air bubble will then be released through the vent in the stock fuel tank. Once you get all the air out, move the fuel selector valve to the off position. Think of this as the off position is remote tank, or the on position is running off the stock tank. So since we're going to be running it off the remote tank, we're going to put it in the off position. And then you simply go ahead and start it according to the owner's manual, which means put it in the standard run mode, pull out on the choke, and turn the key. This system does not require the fuel tank to be above the generator because it is not a gravity feed. That's what the fuel pump that we work so hard at installing does. I strongly recommend that you only run it with both of them on the ground. I'm demonstrating it with the generator up in the air simply to prove that it does work and it will pull fuel vertically. The manufacturer of the fuel pump lists it as a uh, 16 to 24 inches of dry lift on the pump, which is more than enough to do the job that you need to do. And that should just about do it. <laughs>